Welcome back and aloha. I'm Jay Drimmers. Tonight's Friday, which means we're gonna talk about what I call ancient shot to the chest. The soldier hopes like it's, it's just a flesh wound. Story. If he puts some pressure yeah, on it, he like tries to, to breathe, but his breath was stolen. He's choking on all of the blood that he soaked in. Really like Slowly dying, dying. his no, eyes are closing. He grabs at the flag the jacket and throws it. It was supposed to protect him from those explosions, but the bullet hit him. Like a brick from Stonehenge, oh, he flashes back to the frozen chosen where his comrades died in the snow. They where dozed him, even though it was cold. His lieutenant had told him, uh, Wherever the heart is, that's where the home is. is. He's so big, oh God, you can't so help but so notice sorry. the note that's in the envelope he's holding. Is, he's is holding on okay to something weird? strong and golden. He like, opened up the fold, and this is what the note said I'm saying this prayer, God, you called it up, God. I want you to be there, Lord, but Satan is not. And I will clarify the audio with the devil. Forgot what I'm Don't saying. Oh my god, that was so much. Jesus Christ, I hate it when I screw up my intros. I hate it. <laughs> well, great, super screwed that one up. My bad. Um, screw it. We'll, um, we'll just keep going, I guess. Bummer, 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 bummer. All right, um, it's all good. All right, well, anyways, let's, let's just keep on going. Uh, basically. Um, we, I can't believe I just did that, man. God, it's irritating. Well, I was going to say like, Hey, maybe, uh, maybe we're creeping up on making my little, my little fake YouTube button here. <laughs> I made this like four years ago or something. And I, I always have it on my desk. I'm like, maybe, maybe we'll get a real one one day. And then I go and mess it all up. <laughs> That's so funny. All right. Anyways. So tonight we're talking about the, the travels of a night. A knight named Sir John Mandeville, which is also like Mandeville, which is re really interesting. When it comes to these first-hand eyewitness accounts, oftentimes I've found that modern academics, surprise, surprise, usually just cast them aside. They just say, oh, that's just a fantasy. They just wrote it like it was true, but it's, it's, just, it's just fiction. You know what I mean? Even though all throughout the book, I've seen several books where people are like, this is a true story. This is definitely real. And Sir John Mandeville in his book, uh, he actually, at the end of it, he says like, Hey, you know, um, I had this certified by like the King and the Pope and everybody. So this is all, you know, this is all accurate as far as what I'm sharing with you. So we're going to, uh, God, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> We're going to check it out tonight. I'm going to put a lot of words on the screen. There's something called reading. Us uh, older folk used to do when we were young, before our TVs. <laughs> we're going to do a lot of reading tonight. So you're going to have to use your imaginations. But this book leaves... Man, this, you'll see. Watch. You're going to meet monsters, uh, legendary tribes of people, weird, strange, mutant humanoids. Stuff that this guy wrote about in great detail. This is a huge book, so I've condensed it down. I've, I've, these are all the Jay's notes of the book. All right, now that the music is no longer playing. Um, yes, I just did that song. Anyways, let's go ahead and put uh, our, first, our first little bit up here on the screen. Check this out. All right, so. And remember, this is part two. So if you haven't seen part one. We really cover a lot of, you know, the territories and he sort of hints at and teases the Garden of Eden. He's going to he's going to talk about what he calls terrestrial paradise, which is the Garden of Eden, which is Hyperborea, which is a paradise here on Earth physically, not like transcending into another dimension or whatever, but an actual physical real place on Earth. That's paradise. He talks about that all the time. It might as well be the central theme of this book. He starts off by saying in Ethiopia and also keep in mind, sometimes the place names or the names of landmarks or whatnot, are not always the original, as the author himself has actually described in this book. 
Um, and that's the same for directions too, like the cardinal directions. Sometimes in the past, they didn't have the same cardinal directions that we do today. He says, in Ethiopia, all the rivers and all the waters be trouble and they be some deal salt for the great heat is there. And the folk of that country be lightly drunken and have but little appetite to meat. And they have commonly the flux of the womb and they live not long. In Ethiopia be diverse folk and Ethiop is klept, kosis or called kosis. In that country be folk that have but one foot and they go so bleavy that it is a marvel, meaning they move, they move about quickly even though they only have one foot. And the foot is so large that it shadoweth all of the body against the sun when they will lie and rest them. So they'll lie down and put their foot up above them, blocking, using it as like a, a parasol. And he goes on and says, In Ethiopia, when the children be young and little, they be all yellow. And when that they wax of age, the yellowness turneth to be all black. In Ethiopia is the city of Shaba. In the land of which one of these three kings that presented our Lord in Bethlehem was king of. And he talks about the interesting, this is a strange place. I don't, from what I've read, this is not the Middle East anywhere. Okay, not a long time ago in the Middle East or whatever. He's talking about a strange world as he describes it, right? Using modern names and vernacular and stuff, but he's talking about a weird place. Let's, keep, let's continue on. Uh, let's see. Oh, so he's talking about these, this legendary tribe of humans, of which he goes into great detail. Karen Smith. Hey, thanks, Karen. Um, and these ones have one foot, gigantic, and they were known to be swift travelers as well. They would basically hop on this gigantic foot, and then they would use that foot to block, them, uh, block the sunlight. And he says, in Ind, there's a place called Ind, which sounds like a route for the original India, right? In Ind... And I did put a map up here last time of, you know, where I think these places may be. In end, be full many diverse countries. And it is klept end. Klept just means called. It is klept end for a phloem or a river that runneth throughout the country is called end. And that phloem, men find eels of 30 foot long and more. And the folk that dwell nigh the water be of evil color, green and yellow. Hey, you know what? I don't know. I might leave myself up here, but I just realized I'm blocking all the let, all the words and stuff. So I don't know. I might take myself down. I'm not sure. All right. So this is really weird. They have uh, eels in a river of 30 foot long and more. He's talking about gigantic monstrous creatures, basically. Now, remember, the further back in time you go... Uh, my research indicates that in general, life got bigger and bigger and lived longer and longer. There may be, you know, anomalies and exceptions to that. However, there are legendary times that talk about monsters and what I call phantazoids and gigantism. And this book is no exception. This seems like it was written during that time or immediately following that time when there were still leftovers from the old world. So he talks about these green people and eels. This reminds me of the shrieking eels from the Princess uh, Bride. Remember that one? Those are the shrieking eels. They always grow louder right before they feed on human flesh. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I hope you guys like my Vicini impression. All right, let's continue on. In that isle, isle means island, in that isle be ships without nails of iron or bonds for the rocks of the adamants Adamant. In the old world, okay, they have different, they have similar words as us. I'm going to comment. I'm, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> In the old world, they have similar words as us, okay? When he uses this word adamant, it doesn't mean like resolute and just determined or whatever as we use it today. It was a type of rock. It was a, it was a type of rock and it could be, it could be different types of rocks, but it was a type of rock that was known for being dense, solid, and therefore unbreakable, basically. And Many of these were known to be magnetic and have magnetic qualities. So keep that in mind when it says adamant. It comes, um, it's related to like if you're an X-Men fan, adamantium, you know, Wolverine's claws or skeleton. All right, continuing on. Hold on, let me see. We got jumps. Um, there's some people in the chat. Uh, let's see, we got Bissell Kosku. 
Cognitive Eskasi says, uh, Jay, did you see Kanga series? No, I did not. Interesting. Oh, yeah, the Kanga, the Kanga symbol. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that on YouTube. I'm gonna watch Loki tonight. Stacy Adams, you're super welcome. Uh, let's see. Oh, the book. The book is called. Uh, what is it called? I mean, it goes by different names. It doesn't officially have a title, I don't think. But it's called The Travels of Sir John Mandeville by Sir John Mandeville. <laughs> All right, let's jump back over to the presentation. Hold on, let me get my chat. Boom, shakalaka. All right, continuing on. He's talking about, he's talking about the ships and these lodestone mountains that we've referenced before. In that island be ships without nails of iron or bonds. For the rocks of the adamants for they be all full thereabout at the sea that it is a marvel to speak of and if a ship passed by those marches or marshes that had either iron bonds or iron nails anon he should be perished for the adamant of his kind draweth the iron to him that means that the rocks themselves have magnetic properties that pull the ships that are just floating on water. They pull the iron and the nails and the magnetic stuff towards these lodestone mountains. And the ships, they just keep getting faster and faster and faster because it's just being pulled in, basically, right? And so it would draw him to the ship because of the iron that he would never depart from it, no, never go thence. Right, so the people would get sucked into these lodestone mountains, you know, at the top of the world, and they knew not to make their ships with metal, or they would get stuck there. And there are many legends and writings and histories of people who have been stuck there. All right, it continues on and says, "This isle of Chana, the Saracens have one and hold. In that isle be many great lions and many other wild beasts. Oftentimes, I found in the old world when they use the word beast, they're not talking about." Bears and lions and tigers. They're talking about monsters. And there be rats in that isle, as great as hounds here. And men take them with great mastiffs, for cats may not take them. So they had, uh, there's legendary tribes. Specifically, I'll talk about the Tartarians, right? The Tartarians. The Tartarians, or the Tot or Totarians, audience. Brian, good to see you. Uh, they were known for raising mastiffs and Great Danes and giant dogs, specifically to hunt monsters. And they took them with them all over the place because back then the world was full of monsters. And this says there be rats in that island as great as hounds. Rats as big as dogs. Not, not little dogs that you put in a purse. You know, those kinds of dogs. I'm talking about dogs. Which also reminds me of the Princess Bride. The R-O-U-S's. Did anybody say that in the chat already? Oh, yeah, I'm totally live right now. Yeah, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. We're live. Shout out to Tommy Truthful in the chat. What's up, bro? Truth Mafia in the house. Good to see you. All right, let's continue on. Now, let's check this out. Things are going to get weirder. I'm just, I'm just starting slow just to get you used to this weird type of stuff, strange things. This is a historic account, okay? This is not some gigantic fictional book that someone was trying to trick everyone in the future, you know, or scam people and or whatever. No. Listen, books were a big deal hundreds of years ago. Okay? It wasn't we didn't have they, they didn't have like the trolls they had were real actual trolls. Okay? They didn't have humans that were just screwing with each other. I think I'll take years to write like a travelogue book, hundreds of pages, and I'll just trick the world and make lots of money. They didn't have that. You would die. Okay? They don't They don't mess around in the old world, okay? It's not like today. They don't have that kind of stuff. So, take it for what what <laughs> whatever vibes, whatever resonates, you know, on your level. He goes on to say, and at the foot of that mount is a fair and well and great land that hath odor and savor of all spices. Now, this is also legendary for uh, the description of paradise. Physical terrestrial paradise is said to smell like these, these, these smells and these, they're savory. It's beautiful. It's delicious. There's certain balms that grow there and um, flowers and all these. I mean, it's a garden. You can imagine the smell, right? He says that every hour, the day 
he changeth his odor and his savor diversely. So the, the, the smell of this place changes throughout the day because it's constantly blooming and blossoming in different ways with different plants. And whoso drinketh three times fasting of that water of the well, he is whole of all manner of sicknesses, sicknesses that he has. This is the well, this is the wishing well, and it is the, what I call the plasma volcano, Mount Maru, Rupus Nigra. It is uh, the fountain of youth, which is physically a real, actual place, not a, not a nursery rhyme, right? It's real. It's a real place. Um, let's see, anyways. So, whoso drinketh three times fasting of that water, of that well, he is whole of all manner of sicknesses that he hath. And they that dwell there and drink oft of that well, they never have sicknesses, and they seem always young. I have drunken thereof three times or fourth scythes, and yet methinketh I fare the better. Some men uh, clep it, or call it, the well of youth, the fountain of youth. For they often drink thereof and seem always young-like and live without sickness. This also reminds me of the different actual wells that spread out water. Many of these uh, wells and fountains of youth, because there's many, there's one great one at the top of the world, but there's many subsidiaries that go all throughout the earth and there would be certain springs of life, you know, smaller ones in many countries, all over the place. And um, I was doing, uh, I was chatting um, with the archivist and he's, he talks a lot about radium and the radium springs and the radium wells and how uh, in particular areas, the water was infused with this radium that, you know, basically rejuvenated the skin and stuff like that. So people would flock to those places. But somehow over time, those wells sort of dried up of that good energy. Not that they always dried up of water. It's that the water was infused with something else that was active at the time. And men say that that well cometh out of paradise, and therefore it is also virtuous. The well of paradise. In that country grow many strong vines, and the women drink wine, and the men don't. And the women shave their beards, and the men do not. That's interesting, right? Now, keep in mind, he's I'm clipping, okay? This isn't all like, you know universal every description is going to be of different places okay different physical geographic locations you know or whatnot so there's some places where there's little tiny people there's some places where there's giants there's some places where men and women look how we expect them to and there's some places where they don't this is one of those places goes on to say and ye have heard me say that jerusalem is in the midst of the world and so he talks about like the actual location of the city of peace, which is what Jerusalem basically means, right? In the midst of the world. Okay, Jerusalem today is not in the middle of the world. I don't feel like it's not in any way I've, I've ever seen it. Okay, I know people like want to believe it. You know, Jerusalem's in your heart, man. Yeah, it's, okay. Sweet. But it's not in the middle of the world. It's like off to the side, you know, up there. It's definitely not in the middle on any map I've ever seen, right? There's a true Jerusalem. There's a real Jerusalem, okay? Um, and that's not to take anything away from the modern city or whatever. I'm just saying like those people came from somewhere, which was a place called Jerusalem. And when they settled in the new, in the new land, the promised land or whatever, or the place they thought was the promised land, when they settled there, then they renamed it after the old land, which was the city of peace. All right, continuing on, he says, There be also in that country a kind of snails, snails, that be so great that many persons may lodge them in their shells, as men would do in a little house. How many truth in movies have we, how many movies have we broke down and decoded I can only think of one, but is, I've seen a lot of movies personally where people, where they show this to you, the giant insects, the giant snails and worms and stuff like that, that grow or did grow in the past world and that will come back and grow as gigantism returns in the world to come, right? Snail shells so big that humans of our stature can use them as shelter, like little houses, right? This sounds like something out of a fairy tale. This sounds like it's just totally fiction and made up and you know somebody just made it up and it's not real at all the brilliant thing about it is that it's a hundred percent real 
all of our fiction, all of our stories, they stem from a reality that we've just simply forgotten. It's, we're not used to it. You know, we live in the modern world, as did they. When, they. when they told their stories, sitting inside of their little snail houses or whatever, you know, uh, watching out for phantasoids and monsters and, you know, drinking, mer drinking uh, you know, the, the nectar of the gods and stuff, I'm sure they told stories and imagined, you know, a time before them that was much like our time today, which is like the future, okay? They told stories about how people would stare at crystals, which is what I'm doing right now because there's, a, a, there's a, a monitor in front of me. People would stare at crystals and see visions and be able to speak to one another, the world across, without the use of telepathy. And you know what I mean? Like, that was their stories. That was their, those were their, we are their campfire stories. And other snails, there be that... Uh, other snails there be that be full great, but not so huge as the other. And of these snails and of the great white worms that have black heads that be as great as a man's thigh, and some less as great worms that men find there in the woods. So there's also giant worms too. And a lot of times these are sandworms, actually. Not all of them. There's different kinds of worms and stuff. But when gigantism returns to this world, there are sandworms, just like you see in Beetlejuice, just like you see in Dune, just like you see in these, you know, Star Wars and stuff like gigantic worms that live in muddy, swampy, marshy areas that will freaking eat you. Okay. Huge ones, right? All this stuff is, I mean, it's, it's, it, it sounds dangerous in, in comparison to today's world. That's just because you live the life of, uh, a slave god, I guess I would say. Okay, many of you are slave gods. You live a life of luxury, right? But as a slave, okay? Compared to the old world, you know, just, we just sit at home, think everything comes to us, etc. No, no, no. Not in the old world, okay? In the old world, there were dangers and hardships untold and unnumbered in, in today's world. But they weren't just weak, okay? They knew how to deal with all those things. This was common. It was, it was a normal part of life. So it wasn't as scary for them. Our world would be more terrifying. <clears throat> One second, let me take a sip of coffee here. <sighs> okay. Now he says, After that island, men go by sea ocean in many isles unto an isle that is clept Nakumera, that is a great isle and good and fair. And it is in compass about more than a thousand miles. And all the men and women of that isle have hounds' heads, and they be clept, Cenocephales. Now that's interesting. That is the land of werewolves. Okay? I'm just, I'm translating into modern language. That's, those are werewolves. <laughs> like, that's a damn werewolf. I don't care how, any way you slice it, that's a werewolf. They said, there's an entire land full of humanoids that look like they have the head of a wolf, basically, right? And um, I believe that there are, I, 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 I don't know, I don't really lean towards them actually being wolves that turned into people, just like I don't believe in lizards that turn into people or monkeys that turn into people. But I believe that there's something that happens within the DNA of immortals when they get past a certain age and they're cast out by all the younger gods, right? Because they start becoming hairy and ugly and my, what big teeth you have, you know what I mean? Because they're immortal. There are certain parts of them continue growing like their ears and their nose and they get... You know, they go through different phases of puberty and they get a lot of hair and stuff. And so they cast them out into the forests and stuff. And I imagine the, the outcasts get together and form little werewolf communities of lichens. And they talk about how much they hate the younger gods who are clean shaven and, you know, have short pointy ears and basically vampires, right? All right. And it, about these dog people, it says, they be full of reasonable and good understanding, save that they worship an ox for their god. So, they're reasonable, they're understanding, they have a human-like mindset, so these are not just dogs that turn into people, you know, or animals or whatever. And also, every one of them beareth an ox of gold or silver in his forehead, a token that they love well their god. And they go all naked, save for a little clout that they cover with their knees and their members. 
They be great folk of well fighting, and they have a great targe that cover, covereth their body, and a spear in their hand to fight with. And if they take any man in battle, anon they eat him. So, cannibalism is also mentioned all throughout this, okay? In today's world, especially in the Western culture, cannibalism is kind of like a myth. Almost like we just ignore it. Like, cannibal. oh yeah, yeah, sure, cannibalism, but nobody wants to talk about it. <laughs> like, it's pretty soon no one will believe that, that, you know, there are cannibals. There are, in today's world, just so you know. Uh, but in the old world, it was way more prevalent. You know, people ate each other all the time. They're like, hey, you know, why waste that? <laughs> but anyways, let's continue on. Oh, hold on. Troop Mafia. Tommy, what's up, dude? Says, I just want you to know Kimber... Oh, let's see. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right on. If it says, if you type in J, it highlights on my side. I just happen to see you're talking. Oh, uh, what's up, Jason? Good to see you in the chat. Who else we got in here? My chat's frozen. Who just popped on? Who was that? I just saw. Oh, Joanne Betts. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hope your dinner was delicious. All right, I'm going to continue on. He goes on to say, these are, the, these are the sworn travels, testimonies, okay, of a knight a middle, of the Middle Ages. And I've, you've heard me talk about knights and why they have all that armor and stuff, right? These are his tales. Some are first-hand accounts, okay? Others, he went to these places and they were like second-hand accounts, basically. But everywhere he went, he wrote it all down. Things that he witnessed. In that country and others thereabout, there be wild geese that have two heads and there be lions all white. And as great as oxen. That kind of reminds me of this Garfield show my son watches. They always talk about these Manzian white lions or whatever. Anyways, um, they're as big as ox. Okay, the lions are as big as ox. Which is huge. Uh, Double-headed geese. So basically, there's certain areas of the world. And it's at certain times of the world. Where DNA is on high activation. Okay? Any pollutants within the DNA. This is my own little spiel okay but any pollutants manifest okay because nature wants to fix all that toxic mixed up dna that's in you know animals bodies and our bodies especially and stuff so sometimes you get mutants okay as the world as, suffers an influx or is granted an influx of spirit and energy and stuff all of that electromagnetism comes down and it starts activ activating all of your junk dna possibly uh you know giving rise to therianthropy and things. All right, so let's see. I'm jumping back out here, boom. Let's see, let's continue on. In one of these isles, be folk of great stature as giants, and they be hideous for to look upon. And they have but one eye, and that is in the middle and the front, and they eat nothing but raw flesh and raw fish. There's different types of giants as well, right? So just like there's different types of humans, different races of humans, different races of giants and stuff. These ones seem to be the, of the Cyclopean type. In another island, towards the south, dwell folk of foul stature and of cursed kind that have no heads. And their eyeing be in their shoulders. Their eyes. Their eyes be in their shoulders. This is a reference to the blimmies that we have you know, talked about on occasion as well. They're headless people. They look like they don't have heads. I don't know if they actually don't have heads or what's going on. I have to, you know, think about it some more. But whatever they are, they seem headless. Okay? Like, they don't have any heads at all. Like, imagine if my shoulders went up this high. You know what I mean? I don't know. But they're talking about the blimmies. Now, also, I want to point out that oftentimes these are on different islands. Right? And many times these islands I've found are volcanic in nature or have cavernous systems that go down into the earth, which means they're places of power as well, which activate all this DNA and change it and stuff too. Uh, but yeah, all these islands. And there's other stories too. There's, I'm going to share some more other types of travelogues like this. There's a really interesting Irish one. I think it's Scottish or Irish. But it's the same type of thing. They go to all these different islands, way you know beyond the edges of the world or whatever. And every single island is vastly different from every other island. And they visit thousands of them. And in another isle, there be folk that have a face all flat, all plain, without nose and without mouth. 
but they have two small holes all round instead of their eyes, and their mouth is flat or plat, also without lips. So they're strange sounding. This sounds like, you know, something you would see in a horror movie, right? Where do you suppose the ideas for those horror movies come from? History. Real history. The parts we have neglected. The parts that we don't, you know, we've turned a blind eye to. We don't want to think about it. We just want to live a lap of luxury and, you know, or whatever. We just want to forget the old world. Why? Because it's right around the corner. That's the world that is about to creep up on you. And people don't want to lose all of their comforts of their modern world. And in another island be folk of foul fashion and shape that have the lip above the mouth so great that when they sleep in the sun, they cover all the face with that lip. Some big old giant lip tribe. And in another isle, there be little folk as dwarves. And they be too so much as the pygmies. And they have no mouth. So it's not talking about dwarves or pygmies, but another type of tiny folk. They have no mouth, but instead of their mouth, they have a little round hole. And when they shall eat or drink, they shall take through a pipe or a pin or some sort of such thing and suck it in. So they have to eat through a straw, it looks like. For they have no tongue, and therefore they speak not. But they make a manner of hissing and an adder, how an adder does. And they make signs to one another as monks do, by the which every one of them understands each other. So that's an interesting legendary tribe of humanoids right there. Let's see what else they got. In another island be folk that have great ears and long that hang down to their knees. Now, here's another thing I will, I will point out. Okay, many of these uh, legendary tribes... Typically, you're just humanoid, but there's some features that are different for some reason, and oftentimes they're elongated body parts, right? And I will, I have talked about how that may be possible for body parts after the apocalypse to stretch. You know, it depends on how close you are to certain, you know, radio, radioactive materials or radiation, um, cosmic radiation that comes down, and you know what I mean, how it affects you and how, how your interactions with it right? Or lack thereof. But it has the potential to activate all of your, um, your collagen and your, uh, your skin cells, basically, to regenerate them very quickly, but to make it so that the elastin in your skin makes your skin extremely stretchy, right? So some people may have extremely stretchy skin, which would lead to them having like, you know, parts that hang down or, are bigger or whatever, you know, different body parts or whatever. It all depends on your proximity and your experience to these energies as they, as we experience them. And in another aisle be folk that have horses feet and they be strong and mighty and swift runners for they take wild beasts with running and they eat them. So there's also another reference here to, um, to, what do you call those? The part horse. I forgot what they're called. You know what I'm talking about. Part horse, part humans. The hell are those things called? I forgot. You know what I'm talking about. Somebody put that in the chat. I had a brain fart. All right. What else we got here? In another aisle be folk that go upon their hands and their feet as beasts. And they be all skinned and feathered. And they will leap as lightly into the trees and from tree to tree as it were squirrels or apes. So interesting, some sort of, uh, it kind of sounds like what they call skinwalkers today, actually. I don't know about the feathers, except for maybe they're humanoid, so they decorate with feathers or something, but that sounds pretty interesting, right? Oh, a centaur. Yes, thank you. Appreciate that. In another aisle, be folk that be both man and woman, and they have that kind, of that one and of that the other, and they have but, one pap, which is your breast basically, I think, on one side and one on the other. And they have members of generations of men and women. And they use both when they list uh, once that one and another time the other. And they get children. And when they use the member of a man, they bear children. When they use the member of a woman. Basically, there's these people that have both 
sexual organs. There's these legendary tribe of people that have both sexual organs at the same time. They're a, a tribe of hermaphrodites, basically. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in another isle be folk that go always upon their knees full marvelously. And at every pace that they go, it seemeth that they would fall. And they have in every foot eight toes. I think this is the people that have the backwards legs. Like instead of their knees bending like that way, they would bend backwards or something. Like they're double jointed or something. Uh, they're, they're, the legends say that they're extremely fast. Like you would think that they're, since their legs look like they're all backwards, they would have a hard time walking. It actually makes it so they can run and jump incredibly further than we can and faster than we can. Now the pygmies, he says that river goeth through the land of the pygmies where the folk be of little stature that be but three spans long. I think a span is like the width of your hand length or something like that. So maybe like three of those, you know what I mean? Pretty tiny people. And they be right fair and gentle after their quantities, both the men and the women. And they marry them uh, when they be half a year of age and they get children. And they live not but six year or seven at the most. And he that liveth an eighth year, men hold him there being right passing old. Meaning, like, the only, the oldest they get is eight years old. And if you're eight, you're, like, super old, right? These men be the best of workers of gold, silver, cotton, silk, and all such things of any other that be in the world. Much like the dwarves, like the story of the little people, they tend to be, you know, very good at uh, metal workers. And they have oftentimes war with the birds of that country that they take and they eat. So if you don't know the legends, the pygmies were known oftentimes to go to war or hunt or whatever they did uh, with storks and um, herons, right? Like giant herons and storks and those types of birds, right? Stocky legged birds. And um, they're oftentimes shown riding them too. They subdued them. So it sounds to me like their war was them going on the hunt, you know, because these birds were very useful. They could fly on them. And this is probably, if, if I were to guess, the origin of babies being delivered by the stork and dropped off by the stork or whatever, like little people falling from the sky because they fell off of their freaking heron. Oftentimes, they war with the birds of the country that they take and they eat. This little folk neither labor in lands nor in vines, but they have great men amongst them of our stature that till the land and labor amongst the vines for them. And those men of our stature have they great scorn and wonder, as we would have as giants among us. There is a good city amongst others, where there is dwelling great plenty of these little folk, and it is a great city and beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to comment on that. So um, what this is saying is that the pygmies didn't just live alone all by themselves. There seemed to be some regular humanoids like us that, you know, they, they have a, a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with them, right? So the humans would till the land, the pygmies would probably provide something else and they work together, right? But when they considered us and they spoke of us, it was like us speaking about giants, you know? There was a certain element of fear and like wonder and stuff like that. And men be great that dwell amongst them. Um, but when they get any children, they be as little as the pygmies. So they say whenever the pygmies have intercourse with the regular sized humans or, you know, the giants amongst, this, amongst them, uh, then the children are tiny. They don't get like giants by, you know, hooking up with the pygmy. <laughs> and therefore they be all for the most part all pygmies. For the nature of the land is such. Do you see that? The nature of the land is such. It is the earth that determines what people look like and how they adapt and grow and change and stuff. The Great Chan. Now, this is interesting. He, he references Prester John and the Great Chan an awful lot throughout this book. They seem to be the two greatest kings of yesteryear, of the ancient times and forgotten times. Uh, the Great Chan is basically the ruler of one side of this mysterious, huge 
continental area. And then uh, Prester John was the leader of the other side of it. And they were pretty equal. The Great Chen, um, according to his writings, was a little bit greater than Prester John. But, man, you should hear him describe these lands and uh, their their kingdoms and stuff, right? And then he goes into a, a backstory about the origin of the, you know, Chan or whatever. And basically goes all the way back to, like, uh, the tribe of uh, Hem or Ham, you could say, in the Bible. And it's really interesting. There's, I mean, this guy is clearly a Christian. And he's got a lot of really interesting, like, correlations and backstories that he fills in with, like, biblical stories and stuff like that. But we're going to skip all that. The great Chen let keep this city full well, for it is his. And albeit that the pygmies be little, yet they be full reasonable after their age, and can both wit and good and malice enough. Right? Um, so this pygmy land belongs, his territory, that territory belongs to the great Chen. Okay, this is not in Prester John's land, even though they're basically synonymous. All right, now... We go on, and he's actually giving the backstory of the great Chan, which comes from Cham, or Cham, or Chaim, which means life, and, and other related words, right? Cham was the greatest and the most mighty, and of him came more generations than any of the other. Right now he's talking about the biblical story and the genealogy of the three sons of Noah, who survived the great flooding of the world. Uh, there was Shem, Cham, and Japheth, or Japheth. So right now he's focusing on Ham. Um, Ham was the greatest and the most mighty, and of him came more generations than of any other. And of his son, Chus, was engendered Nimrod, the giant, that was the first king that ever was in the world. And he began the foundation of the Tower of Babylon. And at that time, the fields, I'm sorry, the fiends of hell came many times to lay with the women of his generation. Let me repeat that. At that time, during that time, maybe not today, right? At that time, the fiends of hell, underworld beings, hollow earth creatures and entities and people, came many times and lay with the women of his generation and engendered on them diverse folk as monsters and folks disfigured, some without heads, some with great ears, some with one eye, some giants, some with horses' feet, and many other diverse shape against kind. Now, I will say this, too. I want to comment on this, right? There's different ways you could interpret this and, and, and see this in your mind. One is physical, actual creatures from the under, underworld, like monsters that come up, or humanoids, or giants, or whatever which that might be a part of it. But another way to see this is it's describing terrestrial energy that's being released from the earth in particular areas at particular times, comes up, charges up, you know, the DNA of individuals, even impregnating virgins and women and stuff, and, you know, really kickstarting life. And you get a lot of, you know, strange results from that. All right, continuing on. Oh, thanks, Shazane. Appreciate you. All right, uh, and for the nine kneelings, now this is about the number nine, right? He says, and for the nine kneelings and for the nine foot of the way of the Chan and all the men of Tartary have the number nine in great reverence. And therefore, who that will make the Chan any present, be it of horses or be it of birds or of arrows or bows or fruit or any other thing, always he must make of it the number nine. And so then, the presence of greater pleasure to him, and more benignly, I see what he did there, more benignly he will receive them uh, than though he were presented with a hundred or two hundred. So to get something that was, you know, collected and put together in nines was seen as being a greater gift than something that was given in the hundreds or whatever. For him seemeth the number of nine so holy because the messenger of God immortal devised it. Hey, Spirit! Spirit just gave me ten bucks. Thank you. And a little cool sticker. I love it. Thank you so much. That was very kind. All right, let's continue on. The number nine in reverence. Now remember, think about the number nine and how that what letter that relates to or correlates to in uh, Phoenician or ancient Hebrew, right? And 
think about you know some of the things we've talked about as far as the, that particular symbol or glyph. And there groweth a manner of fruit as though it were gourds. And when they be ripe, men cut them in two, and men find within them a little beast in flesh, in bone, in blood, as though it were a little lamb without wool. And men eat both the fruit and the beast. And that is a great marvel. That means that blows my mind, okay? In the old world, when they say that was a great marvel, that means that's, that blew my mind. I can't even imagine that. So there was some sort of gourd that looked like a fruit, possibly could be, possibly could be something else. But whatever it was, they cracked it open and there was some sort of delicious fruit on the inside and a creature that was growing, like a little homunculus. I don't know. That's how I imagine it. Some creature that was growing inside of like a fruit. Can you imagine cracking open like an orange or something and there's like a little, you know, creature inside of it that's growing like a little embryo or something and they eat it. It's a delicacy. And this, is, this, this particular book goes into great detail about the plants as well around this particular area. What's up, Sogio? Oh, I'm on fire. Man, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That's awesome. All right, cool. Uh, thanks again, Spirit. Let me jump back in here. So um, I also want to point out that it's really interesting the types of plants that they describe as you get closer and closer to this terrestrial paradise. One thing that is very interesting, and, and Tommy, if you're in the chat, you remember I was telling you about that... Um, that particular comic book, right? That number of comic book. And I told you to, to check it out. You got to read that in this. It's like this old Superman. I think it's Superman comic book. This is an old comic book. No, it's Batman, Batman comic book, right? Anyways, in this Batman comic book, it blew my mind. They, they talk about this damn forest that has these peppers or these giant plants that have like, like some of them have pepper or whatever. And then this guy, I didn't, I didn't copy it, but it was too big. It was too long. He goes in a great discourse about all the pepper that's on this island, right? These huge gourds that are full of pepper and different kinds of pepper. And people come to this place to get the pepper. And like, like it's oh, just a bunch of pepper in the foresty areas at the Garden of Eden or around, you know, in certain areas or whatever. It's really interesting. I'm like, man, it brought up so many pepper connections for me personally, that this uh, forest is just full of all these different types of fruit. One of them most notably is pre pepper. Anyways, there's different types. This one has a creature that grows inside of it and people eat it. Um, which also reminds me of that movie we broke down called um, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. I'm pretty sure one of those aliens at the bar ordered some kind of drink or something that had a creature in it and he was supposed to eat it too. I don't remember. Anyways. Uh, of that fruit, I have eaten, he says. Although it were wonderful, but that I know well that God is marvelous in his works. And it was a great marvel that is amongst us, and it was of the Bernakes, etc. Moving on. He says, in that country be long apples of good savor. Now, in the old world, when they, when they talk about apples, they don't mean the, the, you know, the tra traditional apple, the, the fruit that we call an apple. Okay, the word apple itself just meant fruit, basically. Okay, so it's different types of apples or fruits of the earth. In French, it's pomme de terre. Um, which is sort of like saying apple, but it's really just a fruit of the earth. In that country were long apples of good savor, whereof be more than an hundred in a cluster, and as many in another, and have great long leaves and large of two foot long and more. So leaves two feet long, right? They grow many trees and um, they grow many trees that bear clove, Gilifres and nutmegs and great nuts of Ind and of canel and many other spices. And there be vines that bear so great grapes, grapes so gigantic, regular old grapes, that a strong man should have enough to do for to bear one cluster with all of the grapes. This is mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament, actually. So there's a story of uh, the, the Hebrew people were looking for the promised land. The problem was that the, they heard that the promised land was full of giants. It's exactly, this all adds up. It's all aligns. Anyways, they sent these two spies, Caleb and Joshua, into the land to spy it out, to see what was going on, how dangerous it might look, to prove that there was giant people walking around in that land, which was their story they brought back. They also brought back giant fruit. One of the things they brought back 
was a cluster of grapes that was so big, the Bible says, that two men had to carry it on a stick just to carry one, one cluster of grapes. That's how big it was. Giant grapes. And they brought back other things too. In that country, the hippotanes that dwell sometime in the water and sometime in the land. And they be half man and half horse. As I have said before, and they eat men when they, make, when they may take them. Okay. So the site, what do you call that? I forgot the word for them. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Hippo means horse. What's it? centaur, right? Fudge. Okay, centaur. So basically, according to this, better watch out. Centaurs are not all known for being the wisest. Okay, I know they're shown like that in the movies all the time, but they were very wild. They had a wise leader, traditionally, um, you know, that could you could talk to and who would not eat you, but you better be careful around the other centaurs. Now, in that country be many griffins, more plenty than in any other country. That's interesting. They just, they, just that he says, like, hey, there's griffins there, but it's not just that they have griffins, it's that they have way more griffins than the other countries of the world, which griffins were depicted on ancient maps, if you look closely. Some men say that they have the body upward as an eagle and beneath as a lion. And truly, they say, they say so, that they may be of that shape. But one griffin um, hath the body more great and is more strong than eight lions. And such lions be of this half. And more great and stronger than a hundred eagles, such as we have amongst us. For one griffin... There will bear, flying to his nest, a great horse, if he may find him at the point, or two oxen yoked together as they go at the plow. For he hath as his talons are so long, and so large and great upon his feet, as though they were horns of great oxen, or bugles, or of kind. So basically the griffins were so strong, and so big, that they could pluck up a couple of horses and take them up to their nests. They're not the only gigantic birds that are, uh, that are mentioned throughout ancient forgotten history, even by historians that even modern academics accept that they're, you know, historian, ancient historians and whatnot. There's the rock. Remember the rock? Not the wrestler, but the bird, giant bird that was said to scoop down and pick up elephants, pulling them high up into the atmosphere and then dropping them so that the fall would kill them. Anyways, interesting that they just talk about griffins so passively, right? All right. Uh, just checking the chat here just to make sure everything's good. All right, looks good. Let's continue on. And a three journeys long from that sea be great mountains, out of which goeth a great flood that cometh out of paradise. And it is full of precious stones, without any drop of water, and it runneth throughout the desert on, on one side, so that it maketh the sea all gravelly. So this is what I, I've shown you this map many different times. Like if you imagine Mercator's map of the Arctic, um, that central island that is no longer there ha was a valley with huge mountains, steep mountains, right? That are, are seen as being impassable or in, nearly impossible, right? Maybe not impossible, but they're seen as being impassable because they shoot straight up out of the ground and they grow moss and they're all wet. So they're slippery. They're hard to climb. Like it's difficult to get into this place surrounded by just nature's walls. Also beyond that phloem or river, more upward to the deserts is a great plain all gravelly between the mountains. And in that plain, every day at the sun rising, begin to grow small trees and they grow until midday bearing fruit, but no man dare take of that fruit, for it is a thing of a fairy. And after midday they decrease, and they enter again into the earth, so that at the going down of the sun they appear no more. And they do, this they do every day, and it's a great marvel. So let me explain to this what's happening. They saw what they thought were trees, okay, that just suddenly grew up as soon as the sun comes out. They have these fruits that they produce, but nobody wants to touch them. And then at the, after the sun goes down, these trees go back into the earth. Okay. It's not like they, you know, not like the flower closes up 
and you could still see it. Like these things disappear. They get sucked down into the earth. Could be a plant, possibly, but it says it's a thing of a fairy. People don't want to touch the fruit of these quote unquote trees because it's a thing of a fairy. And to me, um, there's many types of fairies, but the quintessential fairy is plasma or uh, electricity. Basically, it's a it's a electrical phenomena that floats about and flutters and sparkles and stuff. And you don't want to touch it. So these trees or electricity comes up out of the ground during certain times, right? As it's following the currents of the earth, comes out, sprouts these little fruits or whatever, but people don't want to touch it because they will be electrocuted if they do, right? And then whenever the sun goes away, the circuit is broken and those electrical trees or vines or whatever you want to call them, they go back into the earth because that's where they come from because the earth is electromagnetic in nature. He goes on to say, In that desert be many wild men that be hideous to look upon, for they be horned, and they speak not, but they grunt as pigs. And there is also great plenty of wild hounds, and there be many popinjays, and etc. So in this land, he talks about wild men that have horns, right? Many times I've shown you guys, humans do grow horns, okay? You live long enough, you're going to grow some horns, I promise. It's another part of puberty. It's a phase of puberty that we don't, we no longer go through because we don't live long enough to get to that stage of puberty, okay? But like I said, if you're an immortal, certain parts of your body just keep on growing, right? And uh, that includes your skeleton and your skeletal structure and stuff like that too. So horns, tails, all that fun stuff was a normal part of being a human in the, in the ancient times, okay? In the forgotten times, in the legendary times. The emperor, Prester John, hath evermore seven knights with him to serve him, and they depart their service by certain months. And with these kings serve always seventy-two dukes, and three hundred and sixty earls, and all the days of the year there eat in his household and in his court twelve archbishops and twenty bishops, and the patriarch of St. Thomas is there, as is the Pope here. And the archbishops, blah, blah, blah. So I, the reason I highlighted this, I'm not usually into numbers and stuff, but I couldn't help but to see the correlation between this description and the description that's given of the throne and those entities that surround the throne in the book of Revelation, right? I don't believe that they're talking about actual physical people, that there's seven actual physical human kings, you know, with noses and flesh and stuff like that. And just like I don't believe Prester John was a human being. To me, Prester John is a beam of light that shoots up out of the ground that rules over this particular land or region or area. But when you have that blue beam that shoots out of like Mount Maru and stuff, you have subsidiaries. You have other types of electrical energies that dance about in their lesser forms. And they always surround the king. See what I'm talking about? So it's oftentimes I feel that they're discussing things. They're personifying them when in reality they're mystical, they're magical, they're electromagnetic in nature. Goes on to say, And he had also let make three wells, talking about Prester John's land, three wells, caves, basically, fair and noble and all environed with stone of jasper, of crystal, uh, diapered with gold and set with precious stones and great orient pearls. And he had made a conduit under earth so that the three wells at his list one should run milk, another wine, and another honey. And that place he called paradise. There's three conduits. There are three wells under paradise. Three cavernous systems, okay? An anode, a cathode, and a central well. These are the three roots, I believe, of Yggdrasil, which is said to have three roots that go down deep into the earth, that lead into the underworld. And they create different things, you know what I mean? The electromagnetic energy creates different things, and it creates viscous byproducts, and it interacts with whatever it touches, right? So you're going to find a lot of jewels, sacred stones. It is the Philosopher's Stone. This whole area, um, you know, closer you get to Rupus Negra, it has the ability, it's magical, it has the ability to change uh, the molecular structure of objects that it interacts with. <coughs> Excuse me goes on to say, after this, beyond the veil, 
Now, when you hear, when you see this word veil, like Vicky Vale from Batman, veil means valley. That's actually how it's pronounced, valle, the valle, valle, or veil, whatever. Beyond this valley is a great island where the folk be great giants of 28 feet long or 30 feet long. And they have no clothing but the skins of beasts that they hang upon them. And they eat no bread but all of raw flesh. And they drink milk of beasts, for they have plenty of all bestial. And they have no houses to lie in. And they eat more gladly men's flesh than any other flesh. Into that isle dare no man gladly enter. And if they see a ship and men therein, anon they enter into the sea for to take them. This is a real story or telling of things that we that spark our fiction and fantasies and stories like the big friendly giant remember that i think that was the first truth the movies i ever did uh the big friendly giant you have the land of giants you have the island of giants right and they're known to be man eaters right they're huge gigantic these ones are up to 30 feet tall but he goes into great detail of even taller ones he says and men said to us that in an island beyond, there were giants of greater stature, some 45 feet or 50 feet long, and as some men say, some 50 cubits long. A cubit, typically, was however far it was from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow. This was a cubit, the average length, right? Now keep in mind, if the average height was bigger back then, then the average cubit also was bigger back then. But I saw none of those. So he's, he, he's very good at letting you know if it's something he himself experienced or if it's just a story that he heard when he visits these strange lands. Right? In this particular instance, he didn't see any of the great ones. He says, I saw none of those, for I had no lust to go to those parts, because that no man cometh neither into that isle nor into the other, but if he be devoured. Meaning, if you want to go there, you're going to get eaten. So yeah, I don't want to go there. Right? And amongst those giants be sheep as great as oxen, as the oxen are here. And they bear great wool and rough. Of the sheep I have seen many times. So he has seen these giant sheep. And men have seen many times those giants take men in the sea out of their ships and brought them to land, two in one hand and two another, eating them, going all raw and quick. <laughs> wow! Jeez, man. So, yes, there's a land of giants that will not hesitate to eat a, a person. Scoop them up real quick. Banes. Human banes. The sheep, too. Giant sheep. That's really interesting. Huge sheep. I've, I've also heard, heard stories where those sheep are, they're discussed um, inside the earth, too. In the hollow areas of the earth, they say there's huge sheep, as well as, like, um... Strange elephants, giant, huge elephants and stuff. He goes on and says, In that country, and by all end, be great plenty of cockadrills, that is a manner of a long serpent, as I have said before. And in the night, they dwell in the water, and on the day upon land, in rocks and in caves. And they eat no meat in all the winter, but they lie as in a dream, as do the serpents. These serpents slay men, and they eat them, weeping. When they eat, they move over the jaw, and not the nether jaw, and they have no tongue. Now, this is strange. People interpret this, and they personify it, and they try to draw you know, what this cockadrill looks like. I believe that this is a spirit, or a form of plasma, basically, um, that if you touch it, you'll get electrocuted. It carries a huge shock. You electrocute, and you'll die. And when you die, your body will rot, and that plasma will hover over your rotting body, which is emitting all types of gases, and it's going to feast or appear to be feasting on you, okay? <laughs> which is what ghosts do. They, to, they tend to hover around rotting stuff, basically, because, it's, because of all the gases that can be ionized and it can live on. Freight train, good to see you in the chat. Hey, it's an honor to have you so long. That's awesome. All right, let's continue on. He says, 
The wood under the ashes thereof, the coals will dwell and abide all quick, a year and more. And that tree hath many leaves, as the, ju as the juniper hath. And there be also many trees of that nature, they will never burn, nor rot in no manner. And there be nut trees that bear nuts as great as a man's head. So the two things, one, right, is that these trees never burn. Many of these trees are known to not burn, right? They're, they, they cannot, you can't set them on fire. You don't have to worry about forest fires and stuff. And I will tell you the reason why I believe that is, right? One, there's regenerative qualities the closer you are to these places of power. So the trees, they, they are, they're the strongest, most natural trees that grow. And when, when they grow, because you all know trees grow in layers, right? So when you cut a tree down, you can count the rings, etc. When you see those rings are very far apart or very thick, right? Um, those are more modern types of trees. The older types of trees have skinny little rings if you were to cut one down. I don't recommend it. But if you were to cut one down, you would see thousands of tiny little skinny little rings in there. And that's each layer. It grows very quick. Okay. They, they put on another layer and it's like skin. And the tree is building tough skin to survive forest fires in a time and in a land when the, electri when the atmosphere is, electro is electrically charged and amplified. There's probably more lightning about and stuff like that. Nature adapts and the trees regenerate and they grow quicker and stronger and thicker. And they basically are fireproof, which I thought was interesting. He goes on to say, there be also many other beasts, full wicked and cruel, that be not mickle more than a bear. And they have a head like a boar or pig's head. They have six feet and on every foot, two large claws, trenchant, and the body is like a bear, and the tail is like a lion, and there be also mice as great as hounds, and yellow mice as great as ravens. So this to me, this could be many different things. It's clearly some sort of monstrous creature or gigantic creature. The description, it kind of sounds like how I imagine the, the giant sloths that they said lived, um, you know, maybe 10,000 plus years ago or whatever. Um, kind of sound like that, like the giant sloths or whatever they were, but whatever they are, I don't know. The giant sloths don't have six feet, they have four feet. So whatever these are, are fantasoids. <laughs> like these are monstrous, weird creatures from other worlds, like, like a freaking giant tardigrade or something. I don't know. But, uh, whatever it is, is monstrous. Now it goes on to say beyond these isles, there's another isle that's klept pitan. The folk of that country, uh... They, they till not, they don't till the earth, they don't labor at the earth, for they eat no manner of thing. The people who live here don't eat. They be of good color and of fair shape after their greatness, but they be as small as dwarves, though not so little as the pygmies. I like how it differentiates. These men live by the smell of wild apples, and when they go any far away, they take the apples with them. For if they had lost the smell of these apples, they would die. They would starve to death because they, they're smell eaters. Uh, they, be, they be not full reasonable, but they be simple and bestial. So kind of like animals, you know, minded. Almost like how you would see like a monkey, basically. But it's really interesting. They don't eat. They just smell. That's how they get their nourishment. They, they just take it all in. After that is another island where the folk be all skinned rough hair as a rough as a beast, save only the face and the palm of the hand. These folk go as well under the water of the sea as they do above on dry land. And they eat both flesh and fish all raw. And in this island is a great river that is well a two mile and a half of breadth that is cleft the Bomer. So this is interesting. So these people have um, hair, rough hair, all over their bodies, like Bigfoot, how you would imagine Bigfoot, basically. Uh, let's see. And they're able to go under the water just as well as they are above the, above the water, so they can live in the water, too. This is like, if you imagine that Bigfoot actually comes up out of, like, earthen 
cisterns or wells or waters or whatever below and then comes up on the land and we only really see him in the land because we don't live in the water that would be like what he's describing here now paradise terrestrial as wise men say is the highest place of the earth that is in all of the world now the highest place on the world is the top of the world which is the north pole and it is so high that it toucheth near to the circle of the moon I like how it says that. Um, touches, almost touches the circle of the moon there as the moon maketh her turn. For she is so high that the flood of Noah might not come to her that would have covered all of the earth and the world all about and above and beneath save paradise only alone. And this paradise is enclosed all about with a wall. That's that wall we were talking about earlier. That's the... That's the, um, the cliffs of insanity, right? And men wit not. That means they know not. Whereof it is. They don't know where it is. They lost it. Paradise is lost. Okay, when they were kicked out of paradise, let me tell you what happened. When they were kicked out of paradise, um, we went through an electromagnetic shift. So they couldn't use compasses to figure out which way was east or west or whatever anymore. All of the star patterns changed. The, the direction of the lights that moved in the sky, everything was changed and the earth was completely terraformed. So people were quite actually lost. They didn't know what direction was what. And it took them a while to figure it out. Goes on to say, And this paradise is enclosed all about with a wall and men know not whereof it is. For the walls be covered all over with moss as it seemeth. So you can imagine how hard it would be to scale walls that are just covered in slime, right? And it seemeth not that the wall is stone of nature, nor of none other thing that the wall is. And the wall stretcheth from the south to the north, and it hath but not but one entry that is closed with fire. So there's one entry into paradise, into the Garden of Eden, that is closed up. One place that you can get past those cliffs of insanity. One port, you could say. But it's closed with fire, blocked off, or electricity, right? Burning so that no man that is mortal dare not enter, right? That's uh, the Garden of Eden. And in the most high place of paradise, even in the middle place, notice middle, is a well that casteth out the four floods that run by diverse lands. This is the Garden of Eden. Of the which, the first is clept Pishon, or Ganges, or Ganges. That is all one, and it runneth around the land of Ind, or Imlak, in the, uh, in the which river, in this river, be many precious stones, and much of lignum, aloes, and much gravel of gold. And the other river is clept Nilus, or Nilus, or Gishon, or Gison, that goeth by Ethiopia after by Egypt. And the other is clept Tigris, that runneth by Assyria and Armenia the Great. And the other is clept Euphrates, that runneth also by Medea and Armenia and by Persia. And men there beyond say that all the sweet waters of the world above and beneath take their beginning of the well of paradise. And out of that well, all of the waters come and go. So this is the description. You get a little bit more information about these four great rivers that were known to be at the very beginning of the Bible, talked about as a description um, that describes paradise and where paradise is. Paradise is not in the Middle East. Okay, there are no four rivers that all meet. Like, I know there's two rivers that share these same names. At least, you know, the Euphrates, right? And the Tigris. But those were renamed. Those rivers were renamed after these, these original, basically, right? The people who, who settled that area came from an original land that had a similar, you know, name and people and stuff like that. And they lived between two rivers. And so they, when they settled between two rivers, they renamed it according to their original homeland. Goes on about these rivers. The first river is clept Pishon. That is to say, in their language, assembly. For many other rivers meet them there, and they go into that river. 
and some men call it Ganges or Ganges, the Ganges. Oh man, did I just mess that up? I hope I didn't mess that up. Oh, I didn't mess it up. Sweet. Okay, my bad. All right. Uh, where was I? And some men call it the Ganges. Uh, for a king that was of Ind, the height Gangeres, and that it ran throughout his land. So it was the river of Gangeres, whoever that is. And the water is in some place clear, and in some place it's troubled, and in some places it's hot, and in some places it's cold. Now, these are all like, a, if, if, if we lived in, in the movie Indiana Jones, the Indiana Jones and all of you would be writing this down, taking notes, and drawing your own little map. I mean, you actually don't have to draw one because there's many old maps that show this. But you can figure out where exactly these places are. The second river is Kleptnilus. Nihilus, the Nile, basically, or Gishon, or it was always trouble. And Gishon, in the language of Ethiopia, is to say trouble, and in the language of e Egypt also means trouble, troubled waters. The third river is called Tigris, it's, and this is because it is fast running, like a tiger. For he runneth more fast than any of the others. There is also a beast that is called the Tigris that is fast running. The fourth river is called the Euphrates, that is to say well-bearing. For there grow many goods upon that river as corns, fruits, and other goods as plenty. Now, I believe that the Euphrates is split into seven different heads, as the Bible says. And if that's so, it would be a nice little delta, you know, marshy land, um, not fast running water or anything that you would expect there to be lots of um, food growing a plenty, right? And ye shall understand that no man that is mortal may approach to that paradise. For by land, no man may go. Remember another way of saying no man? Right? You guys remember that? So keep in mind, sometimes they say no man can do this and no man can do that, but it's really code for certain men can actually do this. By land, no man may go for wild beasts that be in the deserts and for the high mountains, and great huge rocks that no man may pass by, for the dark places that be there, and that many. And by the rivers may no man go, for the water runneth so rudely and so sharply, because that it cometh down so outrageously from the high places above it, that it runneth in so great waves that no ship may row against it or sail against it, and the water roareth so, and maketh so huge noise, and so great of a tempest, that no man may hear other in the ship, though he cried with all of the craft that he could in the highest voice that he might. So, what are they saying here? They're saying that of these four rivers, right, um, that are seen coming out of the Garden of Eden or whatnot, that, now you have to keep in mind, Okay, that this, this place that I have shown you that exists at the North Pole, this land, was surrounded by those huge and high mountains, but it's also said to be a crater or a valley. Okay, so there are all these mountains are way up high, but those mountains are keeping the ocean out. Please think of that. So when the ocean comes in through these four rivers, it's a current like you've never experienced before. Okay, it's a mighty rushing current, which is also described in... Um, the book, uh, The Smoky God, right? When we, when we read The Smoky God, it talked about the same giants picking up these people who were shipwrecked, and they took this swift current into the hollow recesses of the earth. Uh, let's see, he goes on to say, Many great lords have assayed with great will many times for to pass by those rivers towards paradise. So many people have tried to go there with full great companies, but they might not speed in their voyage. And many died for weariness of rowing against these strong waves, and many of them became blind, and many deaf for the noise of the water. And some were perished and lost within the waves, so that no mortal man may approach to that place without special grace of God, so that that place I can say no more. And therefore, I shall hold me still and return to that which I have seen. I like that. I respect that. I respect, whoever wrote this, I totally respect. Like, He's he's always keeping it real. So he's he's like, hey, this is a, this is a rumor, all right. 
These are many rumors that I've heard of on my travels. All these people describe this place exactly like this, but I will be honest, I have not been there. Okay. So this is what I've heard on my travels. And that was it, man. That was the first, that was it. That was, the, that was all that we got. All right. Let me hang Let me hang out in the chat for a bit. I kind of miss everybody. I missed everybody. So I just want to say what's up. How's it going, everybody? What do you think? What do you think of all these strange stories? Do you like those? I do. Sojo says, welcome. Enjoy the live stream. Thank you, Sojo. Appreciate you. Jack's in the chat and says, J Dreamers, uh, let's see. How can all sugar come from below the ground? Because they're telling me all the fruits are sucking up all their sweetness from the ground. So there's just never ending supply of sugar cane. I don't know. That's a really random question. <laughs> I don't know how sugar comes up from the ground. It makes it, I guess. All right. Anybody else? Anybody want to talk? You guys want to hang out or should we, should we wrap up? You don't have to talk about the subject. Man. We're just casual now. Okay. I don't want to go really. I don't have anything else to do right now. So I just thought I'd open it up, open up the chat. Do you guys got any, anything you want to talk about? Nothing too crazy or weird, right? Which is like normal, normal world stuff. Ozzy Gold's in the chat and says, JJMers, I watched an interesting movie called The Remaining. Might be worth doing a truth in movies. It's a biblical rapture movie. Well, that's cool. I've seen many types of biblical rapture movies. I do talk about the rapture all the time with my mama. It's, it's, a, it's a particularly interesting chat that we have. Jason, what's up? I see you in the chat. Good to see you. Stacy says, I love these stories. Me too. Interesting history, right? Right? Merci. Says Sophie. Thank you, uh, Sophie. Oh, it's good to see me in good spirits. I appreciate it. Yeah, I like your little picture, Soja. That's cool. Got the blue beam and everything. Portals in the sky? <gasps> dot, dot, dot. What's up, dudes? Come on. Let's talk. Talk to me. Everybody's here. How many people are here? There's 283 people. Look, people are leaving. See that? People are leaving already. <laughs> Does anybody want to talk? Or you guys, you guys like just being told what to think? Let's talk. Let's hang out. Come on. Jack says, uh, J Dreamer, so all the pounds of sugar that we eat come from the dirt. Makes no sense to me. Jack, bro, I have not even discussed sugar. I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm sorry that you're frustrated or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. So the sugar we eat comes from the dirt. Yeah, sure. The dirt. Uh, we come from the dirt, in case you haven't heard. Lots of stuff comes from the dirt. Have I been harassed by electronic warfare? No. I don't, I don't really believe in electronic warfare. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying, like, I don't give it energy or power. Candy says, I've been seeing lots of split mountain symbolism. That's interesting. Hmm. Have I seen the movie Onward? I have. I have. I do like... Uh, there's a lot of uh, good symbolism in that movie, I'll say. Uh, lots of good symbolism. I, I, I swear I broke that movie down, but I guess not. Uh, let's see. When was the story that you read written? Oh, it was written in the Middle Ages. I, I'd have to look it up again, but sometime in the Middle Ages. Uh, let's see, we got Joe Wayne who says, God bless you, Jay. Been a sub for some years now. You are a light in this world. That's good to hear. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's all I really want to be is just a light. I mean, I don't even need to want. I don't want to be a light. I just, I am. You know what I mean? We are lights. There are those of us who are light. We're, you're made of light. You have light in you. It's a good point. Uh, Charles Riston says, I wonder if the islands are still here hidden from our society. I also wonder that. Uh, let's see. Karen Smith says, Jay, I've always heard of us being taken off the planet by a new perspective. I've heard recently is uh, we are marked by God and our light on the earth during tribulation. What's your thoughts? That was kind of hard to read, uh, Karen, but I will say my thoughts I'm not sure what you're asking where my thoughts are on. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking me, honestly. Um, if you're talking about the rapture, then I think people are getting sucked up into space and dying. <laughs> like, a lot of them. 
Uh, but some make it. And some survive, actually, being sucked up. And some stay down here, and they survive, too. All right, Gaia Bella says, Hey, Jay, battling with this chest thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. But good to see you. Oh, uh, let's see. Max711, what up, dude? Says, great live. Do you know any more accounts like this that portray the old world? Yeah. Um, I've got a few. I don't have them pulled up on the computer right now. Um, the one that comes, the one that is, is on the tip of my tongue right now is called The Voyage of the Male Duin. So if you want to check that up, it's M-A-E-L-D-U-I-N. Two different words. Uh, the Voyage of the Male Duin. I'm not sure if that's exactly how you pronounce that, but it's very similar to this and goes into great descriptions. There's all kinds of stories. Um, man, that's the only one I could think of off the top of my head by name right now. All right, let me jump back in the chat. If I can find the chat, I lost it. Jason says, I'm a good dude. Appreciate it. We all have our ups and downs in life, right? And you guys obviously only see like one little tiny fraction of my life, but I, I, I like, thank you. I appreciate it. Like, I can be coward to myself sometimes, so it's nice It's nice to get compliments. I appreciate it. So Joe says, keep up the shorts. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I got to I gotta jump back in and make some more shorts here. Nabia Yahoo Bat Yahua says, did you get your ears lowered and your hair cut looking fresh? No. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Thank you, though. Uh, let's see. How are you with Jesus? Says Shazane in all capitals. I'm good with Jesus. Me and Jesus are buddies. Uh, what else? Oh, you don't have to type in capitals in the chat, bro. Like, I see there's there's a lot of capitals going on that doesn't... That doesn't in this world, it doesn't make anyone's comment stand out anymore. You know what I mean? It just emphasizes and it means that you're yelling. I don't know if you know that or not. I'm just giving you a little, you know, quick little lesson on like, you know, the common stuff that people do in chats. But if you type in all chat, all caps, it means you're basically seen as being screaming at the top of your lungs in the chat. All right. What else we got? Oh, let's see. The Broken76 says, Oh my God, J-Dreamers, you're the dopest, bro. I hear um, sugar comes from the dirt. Duh, yeah, it's a freaking plant. Right on, sweet. Uh, Jack. Jack says, J-Dreamers, salt, I understand, but dude, what are, why are you on this sugar and salt deal? I don't I don't know where this is coming from. You're not, build, you're not building a bridge. I need you to build a bridge so that we connect. And I'm like, oh, I get what you're talking about. Right now, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, let's see. Not sugar, and the reason I bring it up is because we're talking about giant food. Oh, okay, I got you. The giant grapes. Oh, you just, so you're saying like, where does the sugar come from? I think it comes from the earth. I think earth makes sugar. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I'm not. It's not a big deal to me personally, so I'm not really going to harp on the sugar coming from the earth thing. But I wish you well, um, Jack. I wish you well in your research. And if you find out anything interesting, feel free to share it. J Dreamers, Jonathan says, any other natural portal gates off the top of your head, i.e. surface of water, mirrors, etc. Not exactly sure what you're asking, honestly. Um, I believe that there's portals and gates and stuff that take us in, up there into the macrocosm above, beyond the sky, and that there's those that take us down inside too. I don't really, you know, I'm not really a big fan of like imaginary portals that are just holes in nothing. And people walk through and all of a sudden, you know, like they're in a different dimension or whatever. Like that's, that's not my thing really. I'm more physical. I'm more like this world and physical world and stuff. I'm sure there are stuff like that, but it's not my area of expertise. I stay more grounded in like the actual world we live in. Sophie says, Jay, um, will it, let's see, Jay, it will be cool one time on certain saint I don't know if you already did. <laughs> Sophie, I have no idea what you just said. Uh, Joanne says, Today is my granddaughter's third birthday. Well, happy birthday to your granddaughter. Eric Kof says, J Dreamers, have you seen the new Hellboy movie? No, I didn't know there was a new Hellboy. That's cool. I'm going to have to check that out. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, we'll probably wrap it up pretty soon. All right, so we got Chosen Lore who says, J Dreamers, I, I seen a young L when I was high. Got me looking through your video uh, about elves. Just wanted to say thank you. Well, you're super welcome. 
Just wait. You don't need to be high to see elves, okay? One of these days, the world will flood full of the elven race, and they'll come back. So, I, I, I do recommend when that day comes to be sober-minded so you can handle yourself as best as you can. I get it, though. I can totally relate. That song needs a music video. It does have one, actually. I was very sad about my song, my music video I just made. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I was extremely sad. I put it as a surprise on a, on a live stream, and everybody was like, oh, that's the coolest song ever. Oh, my God. You should just make that its own video. And I did, and it took me like days and days and days to edit, and it just it didn't get any views at all. Compared to like, you know, this live stream will probably have thousands of views or whatever by the time we're done. But it's nobody watches it. When I take the time to go edit videos, and it, it takes forever. This live stream, you know, I do like an hour prep. That's it. Right? And then maybe 30 minutes of after work I have to do when I'm done doing the live stream. Uh, editing videos takes days and days and days and days. Sometimes weeks. Depends on the video. And so it's not really worth it to me. Like, I'm not... I hate that I'm complaining right now. I don't mean to complain. I love editing videos. It's fun. And I make damn good videos. But nobody watches them. Or, or nobody's sharing them. I don't know. I don't want to blame you guys or anything. But, you know, they're not popular for whatever reason. So I'm probably not going to make too many more of those types of videos. Because it's, it saddens me. <laughs> like, I put a lot of work into those. And they don't get watched by anybody. So forget it. Uh, do I astral travel? I have. Yes. Stacy McCarthy says, Jay, I've noticed a flinch every time you speak of the Bible or Jesus. I'll pray for you. Let's... Okay. <laughs> um, wow. That's kind of rude, don't you think? See, this is why we don't hang out in the chat that much anymore. You know what I mean? I, I try to be friendly and open it up and be cool with people, but eventually people start saying weird stuff like, you know... I'm demon possessed because I flinch when I say something about the Bible or Jesus. And then I have to prove to you that I'm not flinching. That gets too weird, man. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't need you praying for me though. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go ahead and just block you. I don't care if you meant well or not. You know, sometimes people mean well, they say the wrong, they say the wrong thing or whatever, but that's rude, man. I don't like it whenever Christians say, I'll pray for you. Like that comes across as so rude. You know what I mean? I've seen so many people do that. It's like they're it's like they're cursing somebody. They're not really doing anything positive. You know what I mean? I'm flinching every time I see that's just too weird, man. That's why I don't like to talk to the general public usually. People fucking say weird ass, nuts ass shit. Uh let's see. I mean like really. Like it I I'm open typically to intellectual conversation, to reasonable discussion, but to just, you know, witch hunts and all that type of stuff, that's, that's not me, okay? All right, uh, where was I? Sonia says, J. Dreamers, music of the spheres from an old TV show, The Outer Limits, would be a great truth in movies. Thank you, that is actually a really good recommendation. Not Really Here says, it was nicely done. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I mean, I never ask you guys to share. Okay. So I'm not even asking you to share that video at all. Not once. I'm very proud. Once, once my channel does get to the hundred thousand marker or whatever, yay. And this becomes real. Um, I'll be so proud because not once have I ever that I can recall begged you guys to like my videos or to share them or anything. I never do that. I just let it be. If you like it, then I assume that you will, you know, like it in the ways that you're that 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 you do. You know what I mean? I never ask. I never ask for anything. I never ask for handouts, whether they be likes or donations or anything. This stuff comes to me and it's just an honor. And as long as it does, I'll just keep on doing it. Oh, uh, I know, right? That was so lame. <sighs> Who talks like that? Get out of here. I'll pray for you. Get the fuck, keep your prayers for your own. Like, I don't, I don't want those prayers. Fuck that. Casey Pohl says, J Dreamers, have you heard anything about Intelligence X? Possibly the name of the AI in control of this simulation. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, that's a whole chat. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yes, I have actually heard of it. I'll just keep it simple. Yes, I've heard of that. I have opinions and thoughts about all of that. 
which greatly differ than many of the mainstream proponents, but whatever. Uh, let's see what else we got. They actually didn't have good intentions. Don't let them throw you off. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Nabia says, J Germs, we appreciate you sharing your walk. Thank you. Appreciate you. The Mandela video. Oh, I'm glad you liked that one. Gaia Bella says, I love you, Jay. Forget them weirdos. And you're right. It is a witch hunt. I know, right? I don't, it's a weird world, man. People, everyone's kind of weird. You got to be, I've, I find that I've got to be on guard in this world. People quickly become Agent Smiths out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Strange times, weird people. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you guys' you know, positive comments and stuff. Uh, not really here says, I have made real friends here, J Dreamers. Oh, that's, that's good. I love seeing that. I love seeing you guys laugh in the chat and make friends and invite or like all the new people everyone's always welcoming in new people and stuff and people are you know people are donating memberships and it's we do have a sweet community so i'm so thankful for that uh tanya what's up tanya good to see you all right let's see i i think uh i think that's about it i'm satisfied i hope you are too until next time i'm jay dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye
Oh.